from when she was in here the other night. Um, they also remembered Sandra and recalled one man who talked with her that night. These people in the bar had mentioned to us that uh, they recognized the photographs and they identified the photographs as a female by the name of Sam. This is the uh, name that they knew her by, was Sam. And everybody had mentioned she was with a person by the name of Glenn. Yeah. They described Glenn as having long blonde hair and a beard. He'd been coming in regularly for the past few days. That night, he seemed interested in Sandra and talked to her for quite a while. Okay. Glenn was friendly and came across as a big spender buying drinks for Sandra and the others. When the bar closed, Glenn had asked Sandra for a ride home. He said he lived nearby. She agreed to drop him off, and they left together. The customers hadn't seen Glenn since that it? night. Yeah, she took him home. Do you know where he went? They believed Glenn's last name was Rogers, but they weren't sure. Their description of him matched the one of the man seen fleeing the burning truck. If you think of anything else, please call me. Detective Koblenz would check the lead. Through department sources, we were able to identify Glenn Rogers as a resident in the Van Nuys area. And we were able to obtain photographs of Mr. Rogers. These photographs, in the next day or two, were shown to various witnesses at the bar in the form of a photo lineup. And Mr. Rogers was identified in this photo lineup as a person being at McRed's with Sandra Gallagher. Detectives secured a search warrant for Roger's apartment. It was only a few minutes away from where the truck had been burned. LAPD, search warrant! They didn't know if Roger's was inside, perhaps with a weapon. Uniformed officers entered first to clear the apartment. Roger's wasn't there. It looked like Rogers had cleared out in a hurry. Detectives recovered a purse and a woman's wallet. It was empty of cash and held no ID. No identification. They also found a woman's earring. The earring became significant in that uh, her husband, Steve Gallagher, identified that earring as one that he had purchased as a pair for uh, his wife a couple months earlier. After several days, the coroner made his report. He positively identified the remains from the truck as those of Sandra Gallagher. He determined that she had not burned to death. We learn in the nose area of our victim, there wasn't any presence of evidence of fire, sooting, and so on. That gave us information that uh, because she didn't breathe any of the fire, any of the soot, it gave us an indication that uh, she had died prior to the fire itself. The mother of three, had been killed by manual strangulation. Los Angeles detectives charged Glenn Rogers with Sandra Gallagher's murder and issued a warrant for his arrest. They entered Rogers' name and description into the NCIC, the National Crime Information Center, a database that links over 57,000 law enforcement agencies nationwide. That informs other agencies around the United States that Glenn Rogers, in this case, is in fact wanted in Los Angeles for murder. It would list the agency, Los Angeles Police Department, Van Nuys area, with my name and my phone number. 
if they have any contact with Glenn Rogers and happen to run him, this warrant would show up uh, in their jurisdiction and he'd be taken into custody. Detectives sought out anyone who knew Glenn Rogers. They learned he frequented local bars and worked odd jobs, mostly in construction. They visited several job sites, interviewing his friends and co-workers. Through witnesses and friends, we learned that Glenn uh, did have a temper, and that when he drank, he did become enraged. There was domestic uh, violence involved with uh, former girlfriends. So we knew we were dealing with someone who could become violent, and generally violent when he drank, as it was in our case with Sandra Gallagher. One of his friends said he hadn't seen Rogers in a while, but promised to contact the police if he heard from him. Okay. A few days later, Rogers' friend called. He said Rogers had phoned him from a motel outside Jackson, Mississippi. Local police talked to the motel manager who told them Rogers' room number. Police, open up! The room was empty. The murder suspect was on the run. In the fall of 1995, the search continued for Glenn Rogers. Police believed he fled California after killing a woman there on September 28th. A tip led to a Mississippi motel, but Rogers had disappeared before police arrived. Police issued an APB locally. They hoped someone would spot the suspected killer before he left the area. Days later, on November 3, 1995, Jackson, Mississippi detectives responded to a murder. Family members had found Linda Price dead in her bathtub. The 34-year-old single mother had been stabbed repeatedly and her throat had been slashed. Investigators searched the apartment for evidence. Technicians photographed the scene and lifted numerous latent fingerprints. They found no murder weapon. No valuables seemed to be missing. There was no apparent forced entry, and the killer had locked the door when leaving. The details of the crime scene led Jackson homicide detectives to conclude Linda Price had been killed by someone she knew. In the morning, they interviewed her mother. Perhaps she knew the killer as well. She said her daughter had a new boyfriend. His name was Glenn Rogers. A month earlier, on October 3rd, Linda had met Rogers at the Mississippi State Fair where he had been working. He was charming, and Linda fell for him right away. They soon rented an apartment and moved in together. At first, Linda seemed happier than ever. But recently, she wondered if she'd made a mistake. She told her mother that Rogers had a bad temper, and she feared his mood swings. When Linda stopped calling and didn't answer her apartment door, her mother believed that Rogers had harmed her. Again, Rogers was nowhere to be found. Jackson detectives believed he had left the area. They entered his name into the NCIC database. Learning Rogers was wanted for murder in California, 
they contacted Detective Mike Koblenz in Los Angeles. Jackson, Mississippi at that time contacted me, informed me of a murder they had, and they wanted more information on Glenn Rogers as he was a possible perpetrator in that case. The murders followed a pattern. The victims in California and Mississippi had both been charmed by Rogers. They had been isolated from others, then brutally killed just before Rogers fled the area. The investigators believed that Rogers was on a rampage that probably would not stop until he was found. In our minds, we knew that we had a major problem going on here. We felt if he wasn't apprehended, that there could very well be more victims. Jackson police asked the public to call if anyone saw Rogers in the area. Witnesses reported sightings, but Rogers stayed one step ahead of authorities. The detectives contacted the FBI field office in Jackson. Hey, got you this pictures from the crime scene. I think you're gonna find They believed Rogers had left the state like he did after the California killing. Agents filed a federal warrant for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Perhaps federal resources could help stop the killer. FBI Special Agent John Huber helped coordinate the multi-state investigation. This case was very high speed, very fast. The murder he committed in Jackson was on November 3rd, it was Linda Price. Um, subsequent to that, he committed another murder on November 6th. On that date, police in Tampa, Florida, responded to a murder scene at a local motel room that had been rented by Glenn Rogers. Like Linda Price, the young woman lay dead in the bathtub, stabbed in the back, chest, and wrist. There was no ID of the woman in the room, but investigators noted a tattoo of a cross on her shoulder. Her jeans and shoes were piled near the toilet. A bracelet was found in the sink. From the evidence left behind, Tampa homicide detective Julie Masucci attempted to piece together the details of the murder. When we removed the clothing, it appeared that she had been stabbed through the clothing, which means that she was never undressed. Um, and it was from the rear portion, which appeared that someone might have come up behind her and stabbed her. The shoes had blood spots on the top, indicating she had them on and was standing when she was attacked. Under her body was a man's watch. Investigators believed it belonged to the killer. It was significant that she was placed in a bathtub and that it appeared that someone tried to clean up any evidence that they left behind. We had found towels to indicate someone had wiped up blood off of a floor. Um, it appeared that the bathtub water had been run to try and clean up any evidence that was left behind. The detective interviewed the housekeeper who discovered the body. That morning, she had been making her daily rounds just after checkout time. Outside room 119, she spotted a handwritten do not disturb sign. Housekeeping! She said she didn't clean the room the day before because she saw the sign and wanted to respect the privacy of the people staying there. On this day, the occupants were scheduled to have checked out. When she entered the bathroom, she made the gruesome discovery. Detectives asked the motel manager if she knew about the people staying in room 119. She recalled the man who rented the room 
because he requested a do not disturb sign the day before. They told him he didn't have one. So he paid for another night and told them at the registration that he did not want them cleaning his room. He wanted it to be left alone. Apparently he went back to the room and tore off a piece of a phone book and made his own do not disturb sign and he hung it on the door. The motel manager remembered the same man packing up a small white car that evening. He had paid for another night, so she didn't think he was leaving. She warned him about recent break-ins at the motel and told him not to leave anything in the car overnight. The detectives checked the office records, finding the registration card for room 119. It had Glenn Rogers' name and signature on it. Technicians would later recover prints matching Rogers from the card. Detective Masucci ran a computer check and saw the California and Mississippi murder warrants. She contacted the other agencies and the FBI. Then we started to realize very quickly into the investigation that there was a possibility that this man, Mr. Glenn Rogers, was a serial killer. The investigators knew who the killer was, but Tampa detectives still had not identified the female victim. She remained at the morgue as Jane Doe. If they could identify her, it might help them find the man who had killed her and at least two others. In the fall of 1995, after linking murders in California, Mississippi, and Florida to one man, the FBI and local detectives searched for accused serial killer, Glenn Rogers. The latest victim had been found in a Tampa motel room. She was still unidentified. Responding to media coverage, a woman whose daughter had been missing for two days came forward. She positively identified the body of her daughter, Tina Marie Cribs. Tina had two children of her own. Tina's mother told Detective Julie Masucci about her daughter's last day. We learned that Tina had worked and that she went to the Showtime Bar, which is in Gibsonton and she met some friends there. She was supposed to meet her mother there. Apparently it's like a family bar where a lot of people go and, and there's televisions in there and they just go and gather and talk. Detectives visited the Showtime bar. The bartender said she knew Tina and her mother. She confirmed that Tina had been in the bar on November 5th. The bartender also remembered that a man named Glenn was there the same night. He talked with Tina and the others. He bought a round of drinks with a $100 bill. The bartender said the man was very friendly and won Tina over quickly. Eventually, he asked Tina for a ride home. He said his motel room was close and promised Tina would be back in time to meet her mother. Everything's taken care of, right? All right, great, thanks. Tina finally agreed and told the others she'd be right back. When the mother came to the Showtime bar, she sat there and waited and her daughter didn't show up. So she said she started beeping her to find out where she was. And she said that she had such a close-knit relationship with her daughter that she immediately knew something was wrong when she didn't answer her pages. Detective Masucci also learned that Tina owned a white Ford Festiva, the same kind of car the Tampa motel manager had seen Rogers packing with suitcases. She updated the NCIC report on Rogers, adding the Festiva and its license plate number to the fugitive's information.
FBI Special Agent John Huber was surprised that Rogers wasn't trying to conceal himself. Glenn Rogers seemed to not care if he would get caught or had no fear of the law. He would always use his real name when dealing with people and checking into motels. He would drive cars that weren't stolen, either belonged to the, to the victim, which he could easily be linked to, or his own vehicle. Uh, he was a, he didn't seem to care. If people knew what was happening, he wasn't trying to hide. The search for the serial killer hit the news. TV stations across the southeast broadcast pictures of Rogers, asking anyone spotting him to call authorities. Hundreds of leads poured into the FBI. One promising tip came from a Jackson, Mississippi motel. Two separate callers claimed to have seen Rogers there. Rogers had been in Jackson previously and was known to frequent small motels. We uh, set up a perimeter around the hotel and then we had an entry team go up to the door. Agents were cautious until they could identify the man. We identified the person that resembled Rogers and determined that it was not him. We then later searched the entire hotel and began searching the hotels in the immediate vicinity, but uh, didn't find him. It was very important in this case to apprehend this individual as soon as possible because based on his history, he was going to continue to kill until he was apprehended. Authorities were desperate to stop him. The serial killer was out there somewhere, and it was likely that he was searching for his next victim. In the fall of 1995, suspected serial killer Glenn Rogers had been last seen in Florida. The FBI believed he had murdered a woman there after killing women in California and Mississippi. The FBI soon learned that Louisiana had been his next stop. On November 10, 1995, Andy Sutton, the mother of four, was found murdered in her Bossier City, Louisiana apartment. Like two others, she had multiple stab wounds to her upper body and back. So the Bossier City detective questioned the victim's roommate and former boyfriend. Nine o'clock. Andy's roommate was a waitress and had worked late the night before Andy was killed. When she returned home in the early morning hours, she heard the bedroom door close. She assumed it was Andy and her new boyfriend, Glenn Rogers, in the apartment's one bedroom. Blankets had been left on the couch, and so she slept there. After daybreak, she was awakened by someone at the apartment door. Would you tell Andy I'm here? It was Andy's ex-boyfriend. He wanted to talk to Andy. I don't care. I'd still like to see Andy. Andy. In the room, she found Andy's body under the sheet. <laughs> she told detectives Andy had met Glenn Rogers in a bar. They had been dating for only a few days. Neighbors had seen Rogers leave in a white festiva. Bossier City detectives ran Rogers' name through the NCIC and saw the three other murder warrants. 
They contacted the other police agencies in the FBI. Los Angeles faxed a photo of Rogers to be used in the local investigation.